thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for everyone for joining us today. And uh, we're excited to have this uh, discussion on uh, Yemen, a country that uh, is extremely important and is going through a transition, but is often overlooked in, uh, in Washington in, in terms of its democratic transition and a country that's uh, too often viewed uh, almost exclusively through the security and counterterrorism lens. Uh, for these, these reasons and others, uh, our organization, the Project on Middle East Democracy, joined uh, forces with the Hariri Center at the Atlantic Council uh, more than a year ago to launch a Ye Yemen policy initiative that sought to uh, energize policy debates uh, surrounding U.S. policy engagement with Yemen and to uh, make policy recommendations uh, to the administration and to Congress uh, to help uh, encourage a more comprehensive uh, policy, U.S. policy approach to Yemen uh, and one that was not uh, so, so dominated by uh, sort of what was perceived to be kind of short-term uh, security and, and counterterrorism concerns. Uh, as many of you may be familiar with uh, a letter that uh, our policy initiative sent to President Obama in June of last year uh, that highlighted many of these concerns and made a series of policy recommendations. Uh, and today we're, we're sort of you know, pleased to, to announce and kind of you know, release a, a follow-up to that letter and hopefully all of you have had a chance to either receive the letter earlier today uh, online or we have copies uh, available outside. Um, uh, this letter uh, notes some of the important progress that's been made uh, by U.S. policy toward Yemen and uh, since the last letter that we sent, uh, we were very pleased to see uh, significant increases in uh, support for development assistance and humanitarian aid relief in Yemen. Uh, and we we're also pleased with, with much of the, you know, some of the rhetoric that came uh, partly in response to the letter that we sent uh, that sort of identified, you know, um, goals of, of U.S. policy in Yemen that were very much in line with uh, what our policy initiative uh, sought to see. But having said that, uh, we still think that there's uh, significant room for in improvement, uh, continued improvement, uh, you know, largely in, in along these same lines. And that while there may have been some shifts, that there certainly have been some shifts that are positive to point to and that we're, we've been happy to see over the last eight to nine months. We think that it's important at this moment as the National Dialogue Conference in Yemen has just kicked off, uh, and also at this moment in which not only are there important changes happening in Yemen, but also there are important changes uh, underway here in Washington. And of course, President Obama is just beginning his second term in office, and there have been uh, you know, you know, important uh, new faces joining his national security <coughs> team, including Secretary Kerry at the State Department. Uh, we've also seen uh, John Brennan shift positions uh, from being the you know, senior advisor for counterterrorism at the White House uh, to being now the new head of the CIA, uh, and you know John Brennan in, in his old position was very much you know seen as the face of U.S. policy in Yemen from Washington. At this time, in which some of the key actors regarding U.S. policy uh, toward Yemen are changing, uh, we th and while this sort of national dialogue conference is, is is getting kicked off, and we feel like it's a sort of pivotal moment in Yemen, uh, we thought that it was uh, an opportune moment for us to kind of look at. Um, both the progress that's been made and in what areas uh, U.S. policy, you know, can and still uh, could uh, change and what recommendations we would have. Uh, so t this morning we sent a letter, a sort of follow-up letter to the administration, to President Obama and his national security team uh, that makes a series of recommendations. You know, I think that the sort of underlying theme is, you know, still that uh, despite some positive efforts over the past year, um, it's, it's clear that in Yemen the perceptions uh, remain essentially unchanged, that the U U.S. Uh, engagement with Yemen is dominated by sort of you know, sh short-term uh, approaches to counterterrorism and security and in ways that are extremely unpopular. And this letter um, addresses more directly than in our previous letter some of the um, you know, approaches including the use of drones in, in our CT policy. Uh, it also has a number of uh, more specific recommendations that we will also that will come up in more detail during today's discussion. Um, today we're going to look you know, not, not just simply at this letter, but also we, we're delighted to have a nice, uh, great panel of experts that will give us, uh, you know, uh, some insight into kind of the landscape politically right now in Yemen, uh, how U.S. policy is perceived in Yemen, some of the gaps and perceptions between uh, Washington and Yemen. Uh, and then we'll, you know, toward the end of the discussion, we'll focus more on some of the recommendations uh, that are put forth here. Uh, 
our first speaker today, in just a moment, I'm going to turn to Hafez Bukhari. We're excited to have Hafez joining us. Uh, he's in town from Sana'a uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, in Sana'a, Hafez is the director of the Yemen Polling Center, uh, which is an outstanding independent uh, NGO in, in Yemen that uh, undertakes uh, a wide variety of uh, public opinion surveys across Yemen. They have um, you know, hundreds of uh, you know, trained uh, you know, uh, um, experts that go uh, kind of undertake these surveys across you know, all the governors of Yemen. Um, and he'll be able to kind of give us his insight on some of, some of the perceptions in Yemen of some of the key issues addressed in this letter and uh, the perceptions of uh, U.S. policy and kind of more broadly the engagement of the international community in Yemen. Uh, our second speaker then will turn to Steve Heidemann. Steve is a senior advisor for Middle East Initiatives at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He's also a professor at Georgetown University. Uh, he's someone who's focused for a, a long time uh, on Yemen and political developments there and U.S. policy toward Yemen. Uh, more recently, he's been working quite a bit on, on Syria, and many of you may be familiar with some of his recent work and writings on Syria, but we're um, pleased to have him today uh, to kind of comment on some of the key challenges facing U.S. policy um, in Yemen today uh, amid this sort of changing environment. And then Danya Greenfeld uh, of the Rafi Kareri Center at the Atlantic Council will be our last speaker today, and uh, she will focus specifically uh, on, you know, go into more detail on some of the recommendations that are put forth in our letter that was sent to the President this morning. Uh, she will also sort of uh, couch some of those recommendations in the uh, context of the remarks by both Hafez and Steve. Uh, and she will also comment kind of on, uh, based on her very recent tri trip to Yemen, she just uh, returned uh, last week uh, from uh, a, a couple of weeks in, in Sana'a. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn to Hafez uh, to uh, get us started. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I am very happy to be with you and to talk to you about uh, uh, my country, about Yemen, and uh, especially about the public opinion in, in, in Yemen, which uh, we uh, have started to study in uh, 2004. We established this uh, Yemen Polling Center to study uh, and to do public opinion research. Uh, as you may uh, know that Yemen is uh, mainly rural area country. It's, uh, uh, around 70% of Yemeni population live in rural areas and around 28% live in, in urban areas. And in the rural areas that uh, you can see that it's very fragmented communities, you know. They, they, we have around 150, 120, uh, uh, 4,000 population units in, in, in rural areas. So when we talk about the public opinion in, in Yemen, we consider both the public opinion in urban uh, areas and the public op opinion in rural areas. But this, the public opinion uh, in, in rural areas is not uh, expressive. People uh, and the decision makers, they don't know what their concerns and what their uh, attitudes, because the ex expressive opinion mainly located at uh, urban cities. So when you hear that there is demonstrations uh, in, 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 in Yemen, you should take in consideration that these demonstrations will be in Sana'a or Taiz or Aden or Hadramaut, these big uh, uh, cities. When we, uh, we go to the main concerns of uh, uh, Yemenis, we also think that Yemenis are uh, concerned about politics, and this is not uh, uh, right in, in, in many areas. The, the main concern of Yemenis is the poverty, uh, economies, especially the unemployment, uh, and their, uh, the services that should be provided by public institutions. Uh, then it comes uh, the, uh, in the third level, security. And security is mainly concerning that people who live in uh, urban areas. So, and when it comes to security, they think that security means their own and personal security. It's not linked to the Al Qaeda threat. Recently, that we we have noticed that there is some concerns from uh, uh, 
al-Qaeda because uh, AQAB have started to target Yemeni people and the people in Yemen, they think that they start to be their enemies, but still not that main concern. They think that uh, we have uh, two opinions of uh, uh, perception toward Al-Qaeda. The first, they think that it's an uh, international game and it might be created by the former regime in Yemen as one of the uh, game uh, tools that used by the former reg uh, regime. And recently we have noticed some increasing focus on Al-Qaeda al al and they think that, oh, as uh, AQAB targets uh, Yemeni people, so it, it become, uh, 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 they look at it as uh, enemy and challenger for their uh, security. And this is mainly happening in, uh, in certain areas. Uh, but we can't say that it is the only main player who ruin security in, in, in the country. Uh, people in Yemen in rural and urban areas look at uh, AQAB as one of uh, the main players. They look at the Houthis, they look at uh, uh, Southern Movement, political parties, GBC and Islam, and security and military forces as main players that insecure security in, in, uh, in the country. So uh, it, is, it is divided. It's, you can't say that this uh, image is uh, among Yemen. No, it's, it's different from region to another and sometimes from governorate to another. Uh, you, you can notice that um, in, in the research that we have done, uh, we notice that people in western and um, southern areas feel more insecure compared to the people in the north. Uh, especially in Aden, Hadramaut, and these this, uh, areas, they, they start to feel insecure because of uh, uh, political instability in the country and because of the operations of uh, Al-Qaeda in these uh, regions like in Al-Bayra and, 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 and Abyan. The, the other thing that I want to uh, demonstrate is uh, how Yemeni people perceive the U.S. policy in, in their country. Uh, they think that the United States only concerned about AQAP and just focus on its own interests and doesn't focus on, on their needs and or in, on, on their grievances. And they think that uh, uh, also when it comes to focus on development project, it's always linked with AQAP fighting. So, when they see the uh, U.S. officials call the president, meet with the president and the government, and even if they are development officials like USAID, they talk, they say, oh, we are here to uh, uh, counter terrorism uh, and to fight AQAB through development projects. So people think that only U.S. have interest in Yemen to fight AQAB. And um, I think in, in, in my personal perspective that when you talk about development projects, you don't need to tell people that you are fighting AQAB. You, 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 it is ultimately, you will fulfill this, but you don't, know, you don't need to show that you are just interested in fighting uh, in terrorism by having development projects. And uh, also they, they have seen some of development projects funded by the U.S., but they, they think that it's, they are not enough and they don't see some of this project because people, they want to see tangible things. They want to see schools, health uh, uh, institutions, want to see roads, and they, they, they are not concerned about elections and developing uh, uh, capacity of uh, civil society. They are more concerned about their daily lives and the project that will be directly uh, reach their um, uh, daily, uh, daily li uh, life and uh, uh, daily interests. Uh, the other thing that Yemenis um, uh, has negative attitudes toward U.S. United States policy in, in their country because they also have this. Uh, interest in uh, regional politics. They are uh, 
uh, keen about the Palestinian issue, and they don't think that uh, U.S. will uh, be more sympathy toward their grievances. So they, it, this is affect the image of the U.S. very much. Sometimes they have a, f a few ask some questions about U.S. policy in Yemen. They say, oh, they, they are doing good, and you can find like 18% uh, um, uh, of population, they have positive image of the uh, U.S. Uh, policy in Yemen. But when it comes to the regional politics, most of Yemenis, they, they don't like the uh, U.S. policy, and it affects the U.S. image in, in, in the country. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, development projects, we have another problem, that these development projects, they don't have good governance and good management that can tackle the management of this project. And sometimes this project create more uh, instability in, 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 in the local level because uh, tribes are fighting to uh, manipulate or to manage or to control this uh, uh, project. And there is no good stand uh, standards for managing this development project. It, the people, they, they want themselves to manage this, this project, but they don't have actual standards and guides from the government how the management should be and how do uh, the uh, uh, managers of this project should uh, tackle the management of, of these projects. Uh, regarding the uh, assistance that Yama received for the military and security, uh, it's not that popular among Yemenis. They don't like the assistant, especially the military assistant, because two things. The first is they think that military is corrupt, and if there is an assistant and support for this this uh, military, it should go uh, it should go to the these powers, one of the powers. So it's just to empower one part against. Uh, uh, other other uh, power, uh, s and I think this will be changed if there is unified and professional uh, army in, in, in Yemen. The other thing that they think that this military, if, uh, if it's supported by the U.S. Uh, government, it will be only supported and the capacity will be built just to serve the United States in Yemen, not to uh, have our uh, like patriotic and uh, our national uh, uh, military. For, I think the potential is better to, uh, uh, to support the security, but not the fighting terrorism. It supports the security of ordinary people to support police, uh, to support police. If there is any uh, professional support to the police, because this police is linked to the people needs, and they deal daily with the people uh, security, and will, uh, will, so they resolve their issues. And they are, they will be more welcoming to uh, see support to the police, uh, better to uh, welcoming to uh, see support to Yemeni military and Yemeni uh, security apparatuses to fight uh, Al-Qaeda. But here, we, we, we have to be very aware that Yemenis should tackle the lead here. They should talk about the priorities of getting support. They should tackle the lead also in, in fighting Al-Qaeda. We, we always see the um, US officials and Yemenis, when they meet, they show that they, the lead is, is with the uh, American officials and the American government, and people are not welcoming that. And it is it is local issue, and they will be more supportive if it is tackled by by their government and not uh, tackled by a focus on the role of the United States uh, regarding fighting Al Qaeda or uh, uh, enhancing the security situation in in, in, in the country. Uh, the last point here, I I, I can. Uh, uh, say that the first thing that United States and uh, all uh, the uh, stakeholders and the Yemeni government, they should focus on strengthening 
the state and the rule of law in the country. This is what people are expecting from their government, and this is what people revolted for. They were looking for equity, they were looking for rule of law, and this is should be supported practically by the, by, by, by the uh, uh, international community and tackled by the Yemeni government. And it's, uh, there is a need, uh, as uh, you may notice in the letter, that uh, there is a need for development projects. And you don't need to talk about terrorism when you talk about development projects. When you implement development projects, show concern to the people needs and people grievances and the people expectations from their government. And you can, uh, ultimately you will approach your, your um, goal to, uh, to fight uh, and counter terrorism. Uh, it's, it's, um, it is also good to, when uh, we talk about extremists, it's, it will be good also to look at our curriculum and the schools, in the public schools, uh, religious schools, we have a mess in these uh, curriculums, and this needs revisions by the government, of course, and should the government should be very uh, encouraged to do actual change in this in, in, in this material, uh, because it is uh, considered as a main uh, route for uh, for for extremism in, in, in the country. Uh, uh, thank you very much, and uh, please forgive me for my uh, weak English. And I think there is no solution to learn Arabic to to, to understand yeah. me better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks very much, Hafez. I think that's an excellent overview of uh, a lot of the perceptions in, in Yemen that maybe are often not sufficiently appreciated here in Washington and to help kind of motivate you know, some, you know, some of the reasons that we wanted to uh, put the letter to get together that we've released today. We'll turn now to, to Steve. Who, Steve, I'll, I'll just mention that Steve, Danya, and myself all are signatories to this letter along with 28 uh, you know, other you know, primarily uh, American analysts and policy experts including uh, many former government officials, including uh, U.S. Ambassador to Yemen and uh, former uh, Director of Policy Planning at the State Department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, and, and my thanks to POMED and to the Atlantic uh, Council for both um, taking the lead in the development of this second uh, letter and for organizing the symposium today. I'm, I'm going to be focusing on, in my comments, as, as Steve suggested, on the implications uh, for the U.S. in its engagement with Yemen of the extent to which U.S. policy focuses so heavily on counterterrorism as a linchpin of its strategy of engagement with, with Yemen, and um, in particular in the implications of that focus at a moment when Yemen's political future is being negotiated uh, through this national dialogue process that was launched in Sana'a uh, just recently. But I, I can't resist um, commenting on, on one observation that, that Hafiz made about the interest of Yemenis in strengthening the state. Because, and I hope we'll come back to this, because I think the role of the state in governance in different uh, geographic areas of Yemen is enormously controversial. And so there's much more to this question that I hope we can unpack. But, but, but to get to, to my own uh, comments and, and end my trespass into those of my colleague, uh, I'd like to go back a bit to the period before the Arab Spring, to the end of uh, 2010, to set the stage a little bit. Uh, this is a moment when Daniel Benjamin was the um, uh, coordinator for counterterrorism policy at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Yemen was one of the key countries on uh, Benjamin's agenda at the time. And in very early September 2010, on September 8th, um, Benjamin gave a speech at the U.S. Institute of Peace where he outlined a framework for U.S. policy toward Yemen that actually looked very much like the outline of policy, like the recommendations contained in the letter that POMED and the Atlantic Council have released today. 
Uh, the positions that he took, I think, tracked quite closely with those in the letter. He made clear in his comments that to advance U.S. interests in Yemen would require much more than an, a focus on counterterrorism policy narrowly defined. He indicated that the U.S. was prepared to make a commitment to an approach that engaged some of the underlying drivers of conflict, including some of the core social and economic uh, conditions in Yemen that were such critical contributors to, uh, to alienation, marginalization, economic exclusion, and ultimately conflict in, in Yemen. And, and so he was, he was introducing a shift in which the U.S. government seemed poised to recognize that it needed a broad-gauged, multifaceted approach to engagement with Yemen in order to address the conditions that ultimately were causing the security problems that the U.S. confronted in Yemen at the time, and that Yemenis themselves were wrestling with. Two weeks later, on September 20th, uh, the speech by Benjamin was followed by a letter from President Obama to then President Saleh. It was delivered by the White House coordinator for counterterrorism, now the new head of the CIA, John Brennan, and it contained many of the same elements. There was uh, a great deal of consistency in the framing of the um, intentions of the U.S. government to broaden its strategy of engagement with Yemen beyond counterterrorism uh, narrowly defined. And in fact, the letter that POMED and the Atlanta Council released today acknowledge this. They acknowledge the efforts by the Obama administration to broaden the foundations of its policy. And I think we have to give the Obama administration a certain amount of credit in acting on its um, expressed intent to move beyond counterterrorism as a framework for policy. In 2012, the total amount of uh, support that was pledged for Yemen by the U.S. government was about $350 million. That's a significant increase over what the levels had been in previous years. And what's also important is that if we look at the way in which uh, those funds were allocated, according to the Congressional Research Service, they were intended to support a very broad range of policy initiatives, including things like job creation, microfinance, agricultural development, water and sanitation, food security, health services. In other words, many of the issues that Yemenis felt would become much more central in the U.S.-Yemeni relationship. And in addition to expanding its level of direct funding, the U.S. has been an active participant in many of the international frameworks intended to increase support for Yemen, including the Friends of Syria group, and other uh, friends of Syria, <laughs> friends of Yemen group, uh, uh, and and there have been a number. There, sorry, there have been a number of, of donor conferences over the past year. I, I don't track the the figures carefully, but but the totals committed or pledged must be somewhere in the neighborhood of of nine, eight to nine ten billion dollars uh, in economic assistance and other kinds of development aid for Yemen, although of course the amounts that have been allocated are much lower than, than, than that. So we did have in this period following 2010 until the start of the uprising in 2011, uh, and even after, an effort on the part of the Obama administration to act on its commitment to move beyond counterterrorism as the framing um, feature or element of U.S. Yemen policy. The reality is, however, that unfortunately, those efforts were completely overwhelmed by and, and completely um, eclipsed by what has followed the start of the Yemeni uprising in early 2011 and the in extraordinarily dramatic increase in funding for U.S. counterterrorism efforts in Yemen, the extent to which those efforts have once again become the cornerstone of U.S. policy in Yemen, and the result has been that, uh, that whatever else the U.S. might have been doing in Yemen in the period from 2010 onward, 
U.S. policy in Yemen again became almost entirely defined by it, certainly in the public mind, and I think we heard that in the, in the data that you presented, uh, it, its counterterrorism work and in particular by its reliance on drones as the signature element of its counterterrorism policy in Yemen. And the numbers are really quite striking. We do have some data about the incidence of drone attacks over the past decade in the period since 2002. They're not completely precise. There are somewhere between 43 and 53 confirmed U.S. drone attacks in Yemen over the past decade. But in addition, there are another 77 to 95 uh, drone attacks that have not been confirmed as U.S. attacks, but which are believed to be linked to U.S. counterterrorism efforts. The vast majority of, uh, so the maximum number that could potentially be attributed to the U.S. is 148 drone attacks, attacks over about the past decade. The vast majority of those have happened in the period since the onset of the Yemeni uprising. In 2011 in particular, when if you'll remember what the security situation in Yemen was like at the time, in June 2011, there were 15 attacks in 15 days. I mean, just enormous density of, of drone attacks. So, so whatever else the administration hoped to achieve by expanding its policy beyond counterterrorism, it had almost no effect given the volume and the visibility of the way it was conducting policy. And so the effect of the, uh, of the uprising, um, in essence, has been to shut down or to put on hold, at least temporarily, efforts to reset U.S. policy toward Yemen on a more balanced basis. And that effort has remained on hold while the U.S. and other actors have been enmeshed in trying to navigate this very sticky, very difficult transition process under President Hadi, which has been in place since President Saleh left, left office in November 2011. It is possible that the, uh, that the transition process will end up um, delivering constitutional reforms and national elections by 2014, which is the expected timetable. But I think we have to acknowledge that the process seems, at this point at least, as unlikely to be able to do very much to address some of the broad underlying drivers of conflict, these geographic, regional, sectarian, socioeconomic drivers of conflict in Syria, uh, in, <laughs> sorry, uh, in Yemen. The parallels. The parallels. <laughs> well, uh, we, we can only hope that Yemen does not move in, 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 in that direction. Um, and, and I think we see some of these shortcomings in, in the national dialogue process that's taking place in Yemen now. I, I think the national dialogue process um, which got only fully underway this week or late last week, um, seems to me to have the potential not only uh, to fail to address some of the core underlying drivers of conflict in Yemen, but, but potentially even to make things worse. And what I'd like to stress in closing uh, is that with the national dialogue process, Yemen is actually coming to resemble a number of other of um, countries that the World Bank calls ACTs, Arab countries in transition, which is to say that we have a formal political process in place which seems increasingly disconnected from the core problems that these political processes are intended to solve. And the national dialogue has begun under a cloud of so much cynicism and fragmentation and criticism from so many of, of those who are expected to play a critical role in the dialogue process that it's very difficult to imagine that it's going to lead to anything um, other than perhaps at best some kind of elite consensus that will satisfy the aspirations of the Gulf Cooperation Council, perhaps satisfy the aspirations of the United Nations, but which may well exacerbate some of the underlying tensions in in, in the country. And, and what's especially troubling about this, and I'll, I'll close with this, is that at a moment when I think a concerted push should be underway to make much more far-ranging shifts in how 
Yemen is governed in a way that would deal with some of the, these underlying conflicts in a more compelling fashion. We find that U.S. policy, which continues to be framed largely in terms of its counterterrorism efforts, isn't organized in a fashion that would permit it to engage effectively to help achieve those kinds of broader reforms as a result of the transition process that's now in place. And I think what we have to recognize is that given what's at stake in Yemen at the moment with this transition process, with the national dialogue process, the consequences of the U.S. continuing to be encumbered by the perception that its policy is framed in terms of counterterrorism, the, the, the implications of U.S. policy which lacks the breadth and scope to push more forcefully some of the broader issues of reform that have greater promise for dealing with underlying tensions and conflicts in Yemen, um, have very, th these, these shortcomings have very serious implications. And, and the most pressing of them, I think, is that we could well find ourselves emerging from this process of reform, from this process of national dialogue, uh, with, with very few of the core drivers of conflict in Yemen having been seriously addressed, and as a result, forcing the U.S. into a position where, despite its best intentions, it is again compelled to elevate counterterrorism policy to the cornerstone of how it engages with Yemen, with all of the detrimental consequences that have already been discussed. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, before I turn to Danya, I, I, there's a lot of there's a number of people standing in the back. I, I'd like to invite the back to come up. We have about seven empty seats across the, this front row. Um, so there's no need to, for you to, to stand in the back. Um, now I'll turn to, to Danya, who will, um, as I said, kind of shift toward some of the more specific details of the recommendations contained in our letter, uh, and also um, add insight from our own recent visit to, to Yemen. Thanks, Steve. I would encourage anyone to come up to the front who wants to, because it's a lot more interesting to stare at faces than empty seats. So if you're standing, come on up. Um, I'd like to thank um, POMED and Steve in particular for working with us on this project. It's been a great collaboration. And thank you also to Steve and Hafiz for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I'd like to pick up on a couple themes that both of you mentioned and then move a little bit into the recommendations. And, um, you know, I think actually just starting from exactly where Steve left off, which is to emphasize the danger that we face if the U.S. is seen as supporting the status quo in this transition process and having just returned from spending uh, about a week in Yemen talking with people and hearing their thoughts about the U.S. role and the role of the international community, both within the transition process overall and specifically about the national dialogue, there is certainly that sense that, that the U.S. in particular is supporting a process that, that isn't really overturning the elites um, that have been dominating the political space. And, and there is a specific danger, and I'll come back to that a, a little bit at the end. Um, uh, but, I, but I also want to recognize really how difficult of a task it is to balance the various things that the U.S. is trying to achieve in Yemen, from obviously counterterrorism to ensuring stability in the Arabian Peninsula to securing uh, safe and free waterways, preventing a humanitarian crisis, trying to support a transition to democracy. It is quite a complex myriad of, of challenges, and so we certainly do recognize, um, you know, on the part of the administration, our, our colleagues at State and USAID about, about how difficult it really is to craft a policy that achieves all of these things. And I think what we're trying to do with this initiative and, and with this letter in particular is unpack a little bit of the framework that's been built up. My impression, and I think my colleagues would agree with me, is that for the most part, our, our policy and our programs and our assistance to Yemen is seen as basically the counterterrorism security assistance and then everything else. And there's an assumption that the counterterrorism strategy is in place, it needs to be there, there are real and legitimate threats that need to be confronted and challenged. And for those people that are working on the development and the economic assistance, we're just gonna let that sit there and try and build up as much as we can on the other side to counterbalance it.
The problem is, however, as, as Steve just stated, is that it is still completely outweighed um, by the, the sheer emotional impact, the damage that, that's caused, and, um, and, and the political impact of the way the, the administration is currently waging that counterterrorism approach. And what we want to do a little bit is, is, is open that up and, and look at whether or not this is really the most effective approach um, on both sides of that sort of triangle. Because no matter how much money we pour into development and humanitarian assistance, unless this other piece of it also changes, I think we'll be fighting an uphill battle. Uh, the other thing that I walked away with after my, my visit there is the disconnect between Washington and what happens in Sana'a and, and the rest of Yemen. And um, as, as Steve mentioned, the, the policy, if you were to see it written from, from the White House or um, the State Department about what we're trying to achieve in Yemen, is holistic and comprehensive and multifaceted. But what's being done on the ground does not reflect that. And the perceptions and the way that Yemenis experience U.S. involvement and U.S. assistance um, is, is not connected with what's actually on paper. So I, th I think the, the focus of the conversation is really about expanding uh, the bandwidth of the administration's policies to be able to look at a long-range uh, plan, long-term sustainability, and long-term assistance. The history of U.S. engagement in Yemen has been one, if you look at a chart of funding and, and financing, it, it sort of goes up and down, and there's a sense of, of a lack of consistency. And that lack of consistency and lack of commitment breeds a sense, uh, a lack of confidence and trust in what the US is saying and what the US is doing. And the reason why that's important, and the reason why the, uh, the, the polling research, survey research that Haas has presented is important, I mean, it begs the question, why do we care if Yemenis don't feel that Americans really are invested in their development and, and don't really care about their concerns and their priorities? I mean, why, why is that important to a, a policymaker, a military planner that's sitting in Washington? And the reality is, is in order to achieve our core strategic interests and objectives, we need to have that partnership. We need to have the buy-in of the Yemeni people in order to create a, a stable environment that ultimately will allow the U.S. to um, achieve its core objectives. That's leaving aside, obviously, being concerned about the Yemeni people, but even if you take that away, um, I think there's a compelling argument for why we need to pay attention to that and be concerned. As, as um, Steve mentioned at the beginning, the first letter that we issued painted a picture and, and called on um, the administration to look beyond a narrow lens of counterterrorism. And we really didn't address the issue of drone usage. We tried to <coughs> skirt it a little bit. Um, and, in, and in this one, we, we really tried to look, uh, take a look at that and question whether or not this approach is actually effective in achieving our, our aims and objectives. Um, you know, obviously, if you've been following news in, in the US, the drone debate has come front and center over the last couple months. But this has been mostly from the standpoint of uh, legal questions, lack of transparency, <coughs> moral and ethical issues. There's been very little discussion about, is this actually an effective policy? Um, what is the efficacy of doing this? And we try to take a, a nuanced view. We're not necessarily saying that there's um, that there is never a need or an instance um, or a criterion in which this might be appro appropriate, but rather that it should be a, uh, a very narrowly defined use, a rarely used tactic in an overall strategy, a tactic, not that it, it is the strategy in and of itself, which is how it, it has become over the last couple of years, um, and rather that we should be investing in strengthening Yemeni security forces to deal with these threats and to be addressing the underlying issues that are drivers of instability, um, that are drivers for young Yemenis to join these networks, and to help deal with the kind of instability that, that Yemenis actually are feeling and that they indicate. Um, the Hafiz's center has conducted a fantastic survey on perceptions of the security sector and police. And what you see is that um, El Qaeda and Ansar al-Sharia are way down at the bottom of the list of the things that, that they actually um, feel cause them instability and lack of security. 
So developing an approach where we are also actually helping to build a more stable and secure environment for Yemenis who will value that investment, I think is extremely important. In, in thinking about, again, the policy of, of current US policy and using drones, um, the other thing I, that we're trying to raise is to look more acutely at the political costs that, um, that are involved in this. So I think there's some recognition that when there are civilian casualties, um, there is a huge impact. And, and, and obviously, I, I, I trust that our military planners are, are um, trying to avoid that at all costs. But the other political costs, I think, are, are, are much underestimated. And um, because they are put forward as the most precise tool that we have, um, the, the, it, it, it trumps a, a broader discussion about the other impact that, that we might find. And what's come to, to fore in the last um, couple of weeks are that retired senior military intelligence and security officials are also questioning the efficacy of um, utilizing these. Um, General Stanley McChrystal and General Cartwright, both in the last uh, month or two, have made public statements um, questioning the use of this and questioning the campaign and its overall utility. Uh, there are real questions about who's being targeted, how is the intelligence being gathered, how trustworthy is the intelligence. Um, we generally rely on, on three forms of intelligence, overhead video, signals intelligence, and human intelligence. Um, but even US officials will admit that these, uh, there's questionable um, reliability, particularly when there are cash payments involved in places that are quite poverty stricken. And um, you know, as, as Steve referenced, our history of military engagement in Yemen started under former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. And there is evidence to suggest that the US has been manipulated at times um, in trying to counter um, his enemies or balance uh, competing factions. And that trend and, and that precedent that was set um, continues on today despite his departure. And so again, in terms of the intelligence that we're receiving, this also needs to be questioned about how we're playing a role in that. So essentially, our military engagement is feeding into a complicated web of um, tribal and political al alliances where we may actually be exacerbating a situation um, that's already complicated. So moving um, a bit from, from again, questioning the, the effectiveness of the current drone policy, um, we focus on a couple specific recommendations that we would advance to the administration. Um, essentially, the, the underlying message is that we really need to be taking a long-term strategy that will help uh, the Yemeni government address the very factors that are, again, leading um, and allowing extremist ideology to spread. The absence of social services, um, lack of access to food and water and infrastructure, and chronic unemployment. And until these things are um, adequately addressed, this is going to be a constant cycle. So we would call upon the administration to reevaluate the uh, reliance on drone strikes and to um, pay greater attention to the political costs um, as well as the tactical costs um, that, that, that are incurred um, through these. We, we also need to be paying attention to the broader security environment, again, in investing in helping to train and equip and um, provide assistance to Yemen security services, more broadly speaking, not only the counterterrorism units, um, in order to provide a broader base security across the country. Uh, one of the other things that Hafiz's research showed, um, I wish I had these slides here because it's actually quite fascinating, is that at least in a third or half of the governorates in Yemen, there are no police stations whatsoever. I mean, there's a, a total absence of, of local security. And uh, I think that our resources and our time and our efforts would be much better spent were we to invest in helping um, the Yemeni military and security services um, build the capacity and the capability to actually provide security in those areas. In, in the in the, in the political environment, as, as Steve mentioned, um, Yemen has just started its national dialogue process. It's 
about halfway through the time period of the transition process. And the way the U.S. engages in this process, the way the broader international community engages, has um, a huge impact on how things might move forward. And I think we need to be um, a little bit more careful and gentle about how we engage, meaning we do need to be engaged in supporting the political process and the process of military restructuring, but we should be doing this in uh, subtler and, and quieter ways. Because when the U.S. is seen as dictating the terms or pushing President Hadi and his government um, and taking more of a public role, it perpetuates the negative views that Yemenis have of Americans, um, of the embassy, of U.S. engagement, and it undermines President Hadi's credibility. And I think that comes at a very, um, a very high cost. Beyond the national dialogue, the U.S. should be reaching out far more to youth and independent voices beyond the political elite. Um, beyond um, the cohort that are sitting in the national dialogue, the 565 representatives that are in there now, um, in order to help generate a new, uh, a new generation of, of young leaders that right now feel um, very marginalized and, and frankly a little bit sold out by the U.S. and the international community. So in terms of building, uh, a, a, again, a long-term strategy and approach looking forward, um, I think this is an area where we need to spend more energy. Would also um, stress the need in this transition process to be um, working again quietly with President Hadi and his government um, to encourage them to meet the reform benchmarks that they themselves have committed to. There's a very elaborate framework of economic and political reform um, that, that President Hadi um, has signed on to, and yet very little of that has moved forward. At the same time, there's concern that some of the patterns and, and, and um, precedent under former President Saleh are, are continuing, um, and the U.S. Has, has said little about these types of things, including the creation of a private military force or militia for, uh, for the President, um, the lack of movement on uh, on dealing with human rights violations from during the transition, there's there's a list of many things where we should be um, where we should be taking a, a position on that as well. Um, and the last thing that I would say is, again, in the need of, of reframing and recasting our engagement, there is um, certainly a deficit in terms of outreach and, and public diplomacy. I know our, our friends and colleagues are doing um, are, are working very very intensely on, on trying to get that message out. But being able to put forward um, non-military, non-defense, non-terrorism uh, representatives and officials um, to bring them out to Yemen and to have conversations that really are about Yemen's transition, uh, Yemen's um, opportunities and prospects for democracy, and, and to continue to raise that message, I think, is extremely important in, in trying to reshape that. As, as Huff has said, framing it within um, the value of development and transition and, and not within the framework of counterterrorism means um, will mean a lot, I think, and, and that message will carry far. Um, the most important thing that could come out of this transition is a, a strengthened framework for rule of law, for general internal security, and for combating corruption. And these are all the things that are most important to Yemenis according to their responses. They're also the kinds of things that um, the US wants to see happen and they're all the kinds of things that are necessary for economic development and investment. And um, with that kind of um, investment and, and development and an improved um, quality of life for Yemenis, I think the security situation would be well served by that and would be well served by US investments Diplomacy visits that I've seen in the Middle East uh, throughout the president, you know, President Obama's you know, tenure, um, you know, by by Secretary Clinton or, or you know, a, anyone else from the State Department, and it was uh, she was extremely well received, um, and it underscored exactly the kind of shift uh, that that you were describing that they were trying to have underway. Uh, I happened to arrive in, in Yemen about uh, three or four days after her visit, and, and I heard uh, nothing but praise. In that, uh, and one thing I would point to as well is that that was a that her trip uh, was 
focused on, uh, it was a four country trip to the Arabian Peninsula and it was focused uh, specifically on uh, engaging with civil society. And sort of you know, one of the recommendations that Danya was just talking about, the real need to kind of reach out to independent voices, independent civil society actors. And uh, on that visit, uh, she, she did several meetings with civil society, including a large forum uh, with more than 100 members of civil society present uh, in which, uh, you know, and I met with several of those same uh, civil society actors a few days later, and they were all impressed by what seemed to be the seriousness of uh, her engagement and her desire to engage, and, and they, kind of, they said that in the past when officials want to meet with civil society, you feel as though it's something sort of token, or they, they want to meet with us so that they can say that they did, and so they're not only engaging with the government, but we felt like she was really listening to us, and then it, uh, she went on uh, on the same trip to Yemen to, to, from Yemen to, to Doha, and gave this big kind of well-known speech in which she um, you know, sort of criticized the leaders of the region and said that the foundations of some of the regimes were sticking in the sand. And the civil society voices that she met with in, in Yemen felt as though her speech very clearly and directly reflected the kind of their concerns that they conveyed to her. Um, I, I would just sort of highlight this, kind of underscoring your point that it, it sort of on the eve of the revolutions that, that swept the region, there seemed to be a real shift in the right direction in Yemen and it seemed to be perceived, you know, if not by the broader you know, Yemeni public, at least by sort of those that were most politically engaged and kind of civil That's society right. leaders. Um, but unfortunately, now you know, all of that is lost um, <laughs> due to the sort of escalating uh, you know, efforts on the security side. Um, I would note that one of, you know, while several of the recommendations that we put forth in our letter last July, um, there have been real progress on uh, one of our recommendations was for Secretary Clinton to again visit Yemen in, in the last six months of her, of her term in office. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't able to happen, and then part of, you know, we, we, we sort of had on, ongoing dialogue with the State Department about it, trying to encourage that visit, and one of the concerns cited were security concerns. Uh, I would hope that now, you know, Secretary uh, Kerry, in his kind of opening months in office, might choose to go. He was just in Afghanistan this week, and I feel like if he can go and visit Afghanistan, then he ought to be able to also find time and kind of, uh, you know, sufficient security uh, to be able to vi make a visit to Yemen, and I think that would be very powerful. Um, and, and sort of combat some of the, the perceptions that, that the administration uh, has had trouble with. I, I, I want to turn to Hafez and, and sort of follow, I mean, Steve commented as well on your comment about the, the need to strengthen the state in Yemen and ask if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And sort of, it, it's an it's a important challenge uh, and, you know, not only in Yemen but in some of the other countries that are undergoing transitions, this sort of difficulty of, on one hand, strengthening the state institutions um, you know, in, in appropriate ways. Uh, on the other hand, there's a sort of fear of the sort of repressive and corrupt institutions that exist and the need to kind of simultaneously both reform the institutions while also strengthening, you know, the ability of those institutions to deliver, uh, you know, for the Yemeni people. If you could comment a little bit more about kind of what your polling and, you know, surveys show in terms of, you know, what is it in more detail that people are wanting to see? Uh, what are the priorities in terms of state in institutions, and also, you know, what are the top concerns that they have with regard to the, the way that these institutions now operate? Yeah, uh, uh, regarding the institutions, you know, um, before we had this um, change, before 2012, we already had corrupt institutions, and people were not expecting too much from these institutions because they think that these institutions just work for the regime and the regime benefit. And when the change happened uh, in 2011 and, and 2012, people had uh, very big expectations. Uh, the ceiling of expectations was very high, so they were thinking of uh, having actual, uh, actual institutions that will be responsive to their needs regarding judiciary, regarding security and, and police, uh, regarding public services and development projects. So, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, judiciary and uh, police are in charge of law enforcement, and the, this is what the Yemeni lacks in the former regime, in the former era, and currently, because uh, the, maybe the current situation is worse because we don't have responsibilities, you know, we, we don't have. Um, a government that we can say, oh, this government, GBC government, the ruling party government, or Saleh government. Now we, we, we have a lot of powers are involved in the government, so no one can be 
uh, um, questions as responsible for, for law enforcement and for uh, having institutions. Some of these institutions need even to uh, have actual uh, vision. We, we don't know uh, if they know what their role for uh, and what they are responsible for. So people are looking for this as for state to be present in their areas. And uh, if we look at the data that we collected regarding the presence of rule of law institutions like judiciary and uh, police, and uh, as Daniel said, in, in, in most of our, uh, around 90% of rural areas, there is no police. So, and in these areas also, there is uh, no judiciary uh, institutions. And where there are some uh, institutions uh, exist in, in these areas, they are corrupt. So the attitudes toward these institutions is bad in the areas where that there is experience with. And they are, uh, in the areas that they are not there, they are more, more welcomed by people because they want to see. They want to see the state because they have not seen uh, the state. So their expectation is, in, in, in most of Yemeni areas, to have the state there because they have not seen the state and they have not seen this institution. Uh, uh, the, also, there is, um, uh, I think, an opinion in, in among Yemenis. They think that the, Yem the Yemeni government can do a lot regarding fighting terrorism, regarding law enforcement. But they think the government don't want to do. So they think, so uh, they are much supportive for the government to counter terrorism than supporting the government uh, cooperation with the United States uh, government to counter terrorism. They, they, they think that their government can, can do uh, 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 a lot on, on this. Uh, other point that uh, I want to uh, highlight is the effect of drones. We, we, we have had some of qualitative research which showed that there are some sympathy with AQAB when the people feel that there are drones. But we, we have not done such um, a, quality, a quantitative research, a survey that proved this. So the effect of drones still not be clear. You know, People are more concerned when there are more civilian killed, but we, 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 we don't see that if there is actual effect of the drones and if it's main concern to the public opinion. We have not done uh, such uh, uh, quantitative re research. Thank you. I, at this point, I'd like to uh, open up uh, to questions from the audience. If you could please just uh, briefly introduce yourself, say your name and affiliation, and uh, let us know if you'd like to direct your question to any, anyone in particular up here on the panel. We'll just start right here. Thank you. John Anderson, uh, independent panel. Uh, this is uh, a general question on one hand about uh, uh, the Saudi Arabian role in finding uh, uh, the U.S.'s efforts toward uh, context of uh, um, what's been increasingly mainstream kind of public debate about drone policy uh, uh, in Yemen and elsewhere, and uh, of course uh, the greater uncertainty uh, uh, of targeting uh, uh, the recognition that uh, um, we may not just be looking at Al-Qaeda, but the associates uh, of, and the associates uh, of associates of Al-Qaeda, et cetera. Anyone comment on that? I'm not looking for peace intelligence here or, or, or to copy my someone's sources, uh, uh, but rather uh, your impressions of what is in Saudi uh, role broadly and, and then again more specifically in terms of targeted uh, assassination. Uh, let's take a, a couple more questions here together. We'll come up to answer them together. Just here in the middle. This is from Armando of the Living Mind Foundation. I'm surprised nobody really mentioned the session, what you guys individually think the probability of secession is and what the right posture of an American perspective. Uh, 
and uh, here in this room. Greg uh, at Dillian Center for National Policy. Uh, my question is actually uh, related to the last one uh, about uh, sovereign grievances against the North. Um, how much does that feed into uh, the extremists um, trying to exploit the situation? Uh, and is there any role for the United States in, in this issue, or is it so delicate that the United States should um, tread very carefully on this issue? Thank you. Sure. Keith, you want to start? Yeah, let me, let me begin with the last two, only because my confidence that I have a good handle on what the Saudis are doing is modest uh, at, at best, especially in the South, because they've focused a great deal of their efforts on defense of the Saudi-Yemeni border, on preventing infiltration of, of supporters of the al-Houthi into Saudi province. I mean, things, things like that that I'm more aware of. I, the, the, the secession I issue is a critical one. It is one of the absolute critical fault lines that Yemeni society is wrestling with right, right now. We've seen from the response of the Hirak to the national dialogue process the depth of, of their concerns about whether uh, that process will be able adequately to address the the underlying grievances that they think it is critical to have uh, on the table in order to reach an adequate resolution of, of, of the crisis. And when I suggested that we, we didn't have the mechanisms in place to permit the U.S. to engage as effectively as it might on some of these underlying drivers, that was one of the things that I had in mind. Because in many respects, you could imagine um, a process of dialogue uh, and, and, and uh, a process in which the foundations for broader constitutional and, and state reform are organized quite differently than those that were put together in the current transition process. And the difference would provide opportunities, or the difference in approach would provide opportunities for Southerners to define their political agenda um, much more clearly and independently to have opportunities to undertake some kind of local political process for identifying how their views should be uh, expressed and represented within some sort of broader national uh, political dialogue process, and to lay the foundations for uh, a conversation about governance in which the possibility for a more autonomous, more um, federal style arrangement for, uh, for the South would emerge as one of the, the, the possible, uh, possible outcomes of, uh, of, a, of a transition process that would happen before moving toward national elections in, in, in 2014. But none of those opportunities have, have, have emerged as, as uh, plausible within the current reform process. And so I think uh, the HIDAC feel quite quite reasonably from my perspective that the full spectrum of possible solutions to their concerns have not been put on the table uh, in, in this current transition process. And, and it would seem to me that one of the things the U.S. might have done would have been to think about more creative, differently structured strategies for moving to national elections in, in which the foundations for the expression of these local level grievances would have been put in place in a much more uh, thorough fashion than they have been uh, up to this point. Yeah, I, and I, I would just sort of uh, briefly add to that and uh, echo, uh, I mean, I think uh, that the, the process underway, the national dialogue process, uh, has been um, viewed with extreme skepticism from the start, mm -hmm. especially in the South, especially among you know wide segments of the population in the South, uh, that are you know, their perspective is that they are committed to succession or to independence, and they see the this process as arising out of the, the GCC agreement, which began with a sort of commitment to national unity. Um, so I think that there's a, there's a real recognition in, in the North and in Sena'a uh, by those who are involved in the national dialogue process of that and of the need to sort of uh, you know, re 
reach out and to kind of have Southern you know, inclusion, participation, and for it to be viewed as credible in the South. Uh, one of our recommendations that I would point to in, 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 our, in the letter here um, is that you know, the U.S. should use its leverage with President Heidi's government to you know, encourage him to meet reform benchmarks uh, and, and, and to other commitments. And that includes, um, there were a set of uh, 20 points that were set forth by the, the Technical Committee for the National Dialogue that included, you know, uh, just over half of those were related to kind of confidence building measures in the South. Um, and I think there's, there's been a lot of frustration on the part of those organizing the National Dialogue by the failure of Hattie's government to make real progress in the South that is seen by the people on the ground that would in turn uh, position the National Dialogue for success that would be viewed as credible in the South. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's been, ve been yeah. very damaging and uh, I exactly. think there's been missed opportunities there, but I think even now still at this late point, uh, seems you know progress in the South uh, would be re really essential to, to seeing uh, to, you know, for the National Dialogue and any progress that's made there to be viewed as credible there. Uh, uh, or if, uh, John, your have some comments on that and also on the, the Saudi right. point. Uh, I'll just add um, two points quickly on that. Going back to your original question about what would the U.S. role be or is there a particular helpful U.S. role uh, position vis-a-vis -vis, um, the Southern question, I would just echo um, the sentiment that the GCC deal and the way that it was constructed and then the national dialogue in the way that it was constructed um, are both seen to um, marginalize Southern grievances. And because the U.S. pushed both of those through, um, we are sort of inherently linked with that. So I think from, from the outside, there's a perception and uh, that the international community in general has not taken that into consideration enough, um, has, has sort of given short thrift to um, the, the real legitimate issues that, that people in the South um, are, are, are dealing with right now. So there's, there's that sort of pre-existing um, element. Um, and I think the only position that we should be taking is that this is for the delegates and the national dialogue to determine. I don't think it would be helpful um, to, to weigh in on exactly what that should look like, what the uh, final outcome should be but rather that this is really a Yemeni process developed, designed, led, and implemented by Yemenis, and that, that has to be our position, um, not just rhetorically, but actually in practice. Um, my personal impression is that um, there is some consensus, I'd be interested if, if Hafez agrees me, with me, some movement towards a federal system that would have five or six, um, I, I don't wanna use the word states, units in it um, that, that could actually lead to some enhanced viability economically in that situation that I think would be positive, but that's just my own personal um, opinion. It's not one that I think um, our government should be advocating. I have this just a comment on, also on the, the point of Saudi Arabia. Mm. Actually, I, I have uh, no much information about the role of Saudi Arabia regarding counterterrorism, but uh, as um, most of us know the Saudi Arabia is the m biggest player in Yemen. It's, it's, it has uh, ties with all powers in Yemen, in the south and in the north, and has connections with the military leaders, state leaders, political leaders, and tribal leaders. So, and also there are some of social economic ties. Uh, uh, if you look at the Yemenis, are the, it's um, the most the majority of Yemeni immigrants are in Saudi Arabia, so there are huge connection between the Yemenis and, and Saudi Arabia, and even their perspective uh, on the involvement of Saudi Arabia is not that very bad if you compare it to any other uh, country like United States or uh, any other country, of course, I Iran. Uh, um, the other point is regarding the national dialogue. The problem that Yemenis, they went to the national dialogue without paving the way for national dialogue. And these grievances, because we know the southern issue come as uh, an outcome of grievances and, and problems and, and policies in the south. I don't know why the president and even the international community, they recognize these things, but why they just insisted to go to the national dialogue, which will complicate the southern issue and complicate the future of Yemen. Yeah. They try to escape from their responsibilities to tackle this, 
grievances and to talk about these grievances, to deal with them seriously, and go to the national dialogue and talk about this federal system. It's not the problem, the Yemeni problem is not the system, the political system, it's the policies itself. The people who make the decision, and so they think that they can manipulate the issue by having this federal system, but it is big risk and might uh, complicated the complicating the southern issue, and might we have uh, like very fragmented society and fragmented state. Uh, one a brief comment on, on this question on Saudi. I mean, I, I like the rest of us don't have a lot of knowledge about sort of. I, mean, I think the general perceptions in Yemen is that, that the Saudi role on the intel side is very strong. I would comment. I was in Yemen a few months ago, and I heard from different actors of different sides that that politically, you know, Saudi Arabia was still a very important actor but that it seemed to be playing in recent months sort of a less direct and meddlesome role in the politics and I heard that that was sort of welcomed and something that people were happy with and I, I, I think that there were different theories as to why was Saudi being preoccupied with what was happening in Syria or domestically or in Egypt but there seemed to be sort of a, a bit of relief that Saudi was not quite as involved on the political side as it has been. I think their intelligence role has probably not changed very much. Um, we'll take uh, another round of questions here before we need to wrap Considering all your input from today, um, do you think that we're going to be able to go to elections in February 2020? <laughs> and I would like an answer from the Saudis mm -hmm. on the record. Thank you. Do you want me to jump in sure. on the first one? Sure. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that question about drivers of conflict. I, I think there, there are a number of core drivers that are unlikely to be adequately addressed in the current national dialogue process. We have a variety of, of actors within Yemeni politics who have looked to this process as an opportunity to redefine their relationship with the central state, with the central authority, um, from a variety of different vantage points. And what's quite critical is not to um, uh, make the mistake of assuming that grievances are all of a type in Yemen, because there's enormous diversity of grievances that animate conflicts. And it would take, I think, uh, a fairly sophisticated strategy of dialogue for ensuring that they were all addressed appropriately and on their own terms. For example, with respect to the Houthi conflict in, in northwest Saada province, it's always been my impression, and that have, may have been overtaken by events, 
that this was largely a conflict about renegotiating the terms of inclusion within mm -hmm. the Yemeni political framework and in ensuring greater influence over the allocation of resources, uh, access to, uh, to employment, um, opportunities for economic education, social mobility, things of that kind. With respect to the Hirak, the Southern Secessionist Movement, there's a very different sense of how it would like to restructure its relationship with the Yemeni state. Uh, and, and so some of the underlying drivers of conflict with respect to North-South relations are not about renegotiating the terms of inclusion. They're about renegotiating a relationship that would expand the autonomy enjoyed by groups in the South uh, to determine their own um, th their own modes of governance and and uh, and to do that in a way which nonetheless did not diminish their representation at national in national level structures where important decisions are made about resource allocation about uh, the, the full range of issues that will determine the economic and political future of the South so so those are two of the uh, of, of the very different but important I think drivers but but beyond that we find, and, and I think that this isn't anything new, the understanding of the extent to which the, the really quite crippling socioeconomic conditions under which most Yemenis live contribute to the, the, um, the sense of grievance and alienation and exclusion that feed into a willingness to, um, to, align, uh, to align oneself with movements that are quite hostile to the Yemeni state. And, and this, this is a set of issues that, that require a, a quite profound reassessment on the part of, of Yemeni politicians in Sana'a uh, of the extent to which they're going to make addressing some of these underlying issues a priority. I mean, we all know what, what the socioeconomic indicators are that define Yemen broadly today, and, and, and they're very disturbing. And it isn't a surprise, given the conditions in which most Yemenis live, that they often find themselves um, drawn to uh, extremist movements, extremist uh, ideologies that promise them uh, avenues for expression of grievances and perhaps, and perhaps for securing remedies to some of the conditions in which they live. So, and, and, and there too, I think we, we have a, a national dialogue process in which the number of seats allocated to civil society is very small, 40 seats as far as I know out of 565, in which opportunities for those who were, who were the, the, the real leaders of the uprising in 2011 to help define the agenda of the dialogue have been very, very limited. So there are some, some real challenges in imagining how the process will address uh, this broad range of underlying um, grievances. In terms of Saleh and, and impunity and the extent to which his presence has a negative effect on, uh, on, on, proce on processes of national reconciliation, I think it's been noteworthy the extent to which Hadi, who after all worked within the, the General People's Congress for decades prior to the uprising, has been able to move in ways that I think we cannot dismiss as simply um, uh, for show. In, in reorganizing uh, the political leadership of Yemen. As far as I'm aware, uh, there is only one of Saleh's sons who continues to exercise meaningful mm -hmm. power through a position in the security services, but that the vast majority of his family have actually been moved out of positions of power. And I see Mohammed nodding, which gives me confidence that that's correct. Um, so it, it seems to me as if one of the actually more interesting uh, observations to make about this process is the extent to which Saleh and, and sort of the shadow of Saleh does not loom as large over the proceedings as might have been expected. Now that doesn't mean that the GPC is free of the dysfunctions that defined it during Saleh's period. Doesn't mean that networks of patronage, clientelism, corruption have been completely sidelines, not by any means. But with respect to Saleh as an individual, I, I actually see him exercising far less influence over what's happening now than could have been the case under some other kind of, of scenario. Great. Uh, Hafez, if you'd like to uh, take this question sort of clarifying you know, the statistics that yeah, you're citing yeah, on, on US policy. Yeah, yeah. But, but first uh, of all, I, I would like to, uh, uh, like to uh, address w what Steven said 
it's not the question what Saleh is doing, it's the question what Hadi is doing. So <laughs> if, yes. uh, what Hadi is doing and Saleh like confront him from doing his, his, his business as, as president. So the question is the lack of doing from Hadi side, not the troubles that can Saleh make uh, against tra tra transition. Uh, re regarding the immunity and uh, the transition that we have, we know how we resolve the issue of uprising in Yemen. It was in the middle, the uprising against Saleh, and they just agreed on this deal, and they composed this government. So we can't say even former regime and current regime, because we, we don't have former regime, we don't have current regime. All of them are current now. Uh, uh, regarding the percentage, we, we, we have asked question on uh, what's your attitude toward United States policy in Yemen. 63% were strongly negative or to somewhat negative. 18% they, they don't know or, the, or uh, they don't answer, and the 18% were uh, uh, completely positive or to somewhat positive uh, regarding this uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, regarding the elections, I think we will have, we'll I expect, I expect that we will have presidential election in 2014, but not have uh, parliamentary elections, because the differences and the fight against uh, a parliament will be huge, and we have a lot of groups they can agree, all of them, on Hadi to run again for new election and to have five or uh, seven years period. I, I agree. I didn't mention that, but I do agree. sort of reference this, but largely speaking, economic issues are not on the table, and this was one of the major driving concerns. Corruption is not on the table um, for all intents and purposes. Of the nine working groups that have been indicated for the national dialogue, some of the, the key drivers of instability are not going to be addressed and are not going to be uh, discussed. And this reflects a larger concern that I've had about the national dialogue in general, sucking the oxygen out of the political space in Yemen, so that all attention is focused on the national dialogue, which is important and should be supported. Um, but the, um, the the detracting element of that is that the government, um, in part because it's divided between um, you know former ruling party and, and opposition coalition representatives, is highly dysfunctional. It's very lethargic and sclerotic and. Um, is not taking any proactive measures towards generating uh, new growth or employment or job creation. So on one hand, you have all attention focused on a process that um, is somewhat inherently flawed for reasons outlined here, though I'm cautiously optimistic in any case. Um, and, and at the same time, there's a complete lack of action and, and uh, paralysis on the part of the government um, in order to take action on other things outside the national dialogue that are not going to be discussed because everyone is positioning themselves towards um, the coming elections, uh, which I also don't think will be in 2014, um, as well as their own political futures. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stagnation period um, in terms of a lot, a lot of important things and decisions that should be made. Um, in terms of uh, Saleh and his role, I think the U.S. has actually been doing quite a lot uh, behind the scenes to pressure um, him and his departure and the U.N. Um, Security Council resolution that specifically calls him out um, a, as a potential spoiler um, is, is a pretty strong message. I'm not sure what more the U.S. could do. Again, I think it's up to Hadi to make some difficult decisions and uh, a lot of what I've heard is that he actually could be making um, bolder decisions um, and is choosing not to because I think mostly based out of fear and self-preservation in, in large part. Um, but he has a lot of support that could be leveraged far more than it is. And um, we're expecting to see an announcement, a uh, presidential directive about further military restructuring in the coming weeks. And um, knock on wood, maybe Ahmed Ali and Ali Mohsen will not be uh, one of the seven but we'll see what, what President Hadi decides to do on that. But I think that will determine in large part um, influence of the family moving forward. 
Okay, thanks very much. Um, pretty we're out of time, but uh, thanks for all of you for coming, and we look forward to kind of continuing to drive forward these debates and discussion regarding Yemen in the month ahead.